so wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Am Thank I on? You. Am I on? Am I on? Am I on? I'm going to keep talking until I can hear. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. I, w was I on? I hope I was <laughs> I hope you I was. You were definitely I was, on. Okay. You were on. You were on okay. in all the ways you would hope to be. Um, <laughs> let's give Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt a huge round of applause. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. On behalf of both of us, I want to thank Common Ground, uh, this amazing speaker series here in our hometown. Both of us have the pleasure and honor of getting to travel around this nation with our work, and we show up in other people's towns yeah. <laughs> and at the invitation of other people's speaker series. And um, it's actually an incredible honor when your hometown uh, folks decide uh, that your message is worthy of hometown ears. <laughs> so we are both grateful to be here, grateful to Common Ground. Thank you. Thank you. Grateful to Sacred Heart and James Everett and his team um, for hosting us. And really grateful to all of you for turning out on what feels to be the coldest night in <laughs> <laughs> Atherton, Menlo Park, and Palo Alto history um, to turn out to, to hear a talk on the easy subject of race. Um, so I, I'm really grateful. I know Dr. Eberhardt is too, uh, that you're here. Some of you are still wrapped in your scarves, which is really cute. Um, I would recommend you unwrap your scarves because when you go outside, you're going to want your scarf to feel yeah. like warmth. So, um, but that's the old Wisconsin kid in me talking <laughs> who remembers cold, much colder than this. Um, I happen to believe, and I think many of you do as well, that Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt is one of the most important thinkers of our time. And that is because she's a brilliant scholar, but we have a lot of those. She's a brilliant scholar who's devoted her work to a seemingly intractable subject, but we have a lot of those. A subject that threatens our very existence, our safety as humans. There's a small number of those. What sets Dr. Eberhardt and her subject apart is that her research shows there's something we can do about it. This isn't gun violence where we have to convince our legislators to act. This isn't climate change where we have to figure out in a moment how to save all of us from what is happening to the planet. This is an illness. It is an error. It is um, an infection that lives in our minds and hearts, not because any one of us did anything wrong, yeah. but because this is how we've been taught as Americans, to think about race. And Dr. Eberhardt is one of the most important thinkers of our time because she not only presents the research, but she's guiding us as individuals and educators and law enforcement and so on and so forth forward regarding what to do about it. So I am humbled to get to be here with you, grateful for this book, grateful that you exist in this time because, boy, are you needed. <laughs> Dr. E <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Dr. Eberhardt is, of course, a renowned scholar and a MacArthur Genius Award winner, which is so incredibly wonderful. She's the author of Biased, where she takes her scholarly research from down the road at Stanford and packs it into a book for lay people, right? So this isn't the social psychologist speaking to other psychologists. This is the social psychologist speaking with us. And I implore you to pick up a copy on the way out. In the, in the book, she's tapping into what is wrong in our American psyche around race. And it is um, incredibly readable. You've seen a little glimpse of it uh, in the slides. And um, when you get it, I think you'll be inspired um, to learn more. My take on this subject through my book, Real American, is a much more personal one. I've simply written a memoir about my own lived experience as a black and biracial woman growing up in this America um, for whom racism was this force that distorted my way of thinking about myself. So I was this black kid who grew up in white spaces and learned pretty young yeah. that something was wrong with me and my black daddy 
because of our skin. I figured that out at about age three or four. Now my experience is much different, I presume, from Dr. Eberhardt's. Simply looking at us, our difference in skin tone tells you something about our difference in our experiences growing up as little girls and in the schooling system and in college and grad school and the streets of America. So there's some things we have in common and I'm here to say I'm so much, I, I have this light skin which gives me privilege, I've got a white mother which gives me an adjacency to whiteness, I've got a white husband. These things take me into the whiter world uh, in a way that confers privilege upon me that Dr. Eberhardt may not have. She's mm. chosen to marry a black man. A handsome black man. A handsome black man <laughs> who shaves his head. <laughs> and because my handsome husband is in the audience, I want to say that he's, he's this lovely white Jewish guy with long hair. And he, he's really handsome too. Okay. So, um, <laughs> and I think what we have in common, most of all, is that we're the mom of black children. And we're hoping, I'm hoping, that you're here tonight because you want to make our community better and safer and kinder for our children. Our America is increasingly hateful toward people with brown skin, toward black people and brown people and other people, yes. But we have a crisis afoot with the resurgence of white nationalism and white supremacy and the Nazis and the white nationalists marching in Charlottesville, a college town which could have been Palo Alto. This is our America, this is our moment, and those of us on the stage and in the audience and in our town raising children with dark skin are afraid. And we need you to be the village that will ensure that our children can grow up like any other child and be safe and be seen and be treated with kindness and get opportunity according to what they deserve, according to their merits. That's what we want. And I see your work mm -hmm. as an invitation to all of us to examine these implicit biases that lurk in all of us, yeah. to examine those things and to take action and make this a safer place for kids like ours and plenty others, plenty of others. So I want to ask you, because in the book you said, you know, this is your work, this is your scholarship, you've been pursuing this for decades. And at some point you say, and yet it was so disheartening to produce these studies. Yeah. You know, it made you sad, it made you weary. It strikes me that as a black woman with children doing this work, you cannot escape the reality of implicit bias. You have chosen it yeah. as your uh, expertise and you also walk these pathways of life as a black woman and as a mother of black children. So why did you decide to focus on this? <laughs> there, were, there were easier topics yeah, that would have landed true. you tenure. <laughs> that's you know, true. So why this? Much easier. Yes. I mean, I easier think, on the psyche and yeah, the heart. Yeah. And I was discouraged for a lot of my career from focusing on race, believe it or not. Really? Um, yeah. Meaning you yourself discouraged yourself no, or others discouraged no, you? No, the, the, the sort of the, the academics uh, in, the, in the field. Um, I mean, I think, you know, for psychologists, I mean, we like to study um, human behavior. That, that, that is very, like, sort of universal human mm -hmm. behavior that's general and that, you know, kind of could... You Applies know, to everyone. One? Yes. Is that yeah, what you were trying yeah, to say? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so that's, that's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, um, you know, in terms of the research itself, it, it actually gives me refuge, um, you know, as, as a, as, from being a mother of, of, of black sons. I actually have three black uh, sons, um, young men now. Um, and um, it allows me to um, actually examine this um, you know, through science at, 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 a, at a distance and to look at it and to analyze it from the outside. I, I find it 
you know, the research itself is empowering for me because um, I can, you know, sort of have some control um, over what's happening through the laboratory studies. And then, you know, as I do that, I can generate knowledge that could be useful, you know, to other people, um, you know, not just to, for me or for, for my family, but for, um, you know, other people who are, you know, you know dealing with these issues. And um, for other people who are worried, um, you know, not only about uh, being, you know, having sons where they could be a target of bias, but for people who have um, children where they're trying to protect them from 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 being biased, right? Um, they want to they want to raise children who who um, you know don't act on bias, and so for for parents, you know, for, from all angles, I, I think. Um, we, we, we want to have a better sense of how this works and um, what we can do and sort of what steps we can take. And so that drives my work. I, I find that um, empowering, actually. I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> I am. So nobody wants to be called a racist. Now tap your hand on your right leg if you think you're, no, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, uh, do it quickly. No. Relax. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, racist turned out to be one of the worst things you could be called in America. That's true. Um, and, that is true. Uh, which I guess is good. Um, um, and so you say in the book that racism um, uh, isn't the same thing as implicit bias, that mm -hmm. just because you have, we all have implicit bias doesn't make us all racist. What's the difference? I mean, I think when people think about racism, they think about, you know, something that's, um, you know, hateful. I mean, they are thinking about um, Charlottesville. They're thinking about, you know, burning crosses. They're, you know, thinking about, um, you know, white supremacy. They're thinking about, you know, um, people who have, um, you know, hate in, in, in their hearts. And, and so um, with this bias that we're talking about um, is, um, you know, a bias that you can um, be infected by, to use your words, uh, without, um, knowing uh, so uh, with, without understanding it. Um, and um, even when we have knowledge of the associations um, that exist out there, you know, with African Americans in crime, for example, we don't always know that we're, we ourselves are acting on that, that that's influencing us, that it, that's changing our behavior or it's changing how we might uh, vote or think about policies and that kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's, it's one of those things that it's it's, um, it could be subtle. Um, you could sort of think about if you know, if you're a good person that that you don't have a bias. But you know, we all um, because of the world that we're growing up in, that and what we're immersed in, what we're surrounded by, um, um, you know, that has an effect on us. I mean, it has an effect, a, a deep effect on how our brains function. So, so it's ways, different. It's yeah. different. Your research sort of lets us off the hook in a good way. Um, there's nothing wrong with you if you're implicitly biased. You are implicitly biased because you live in this society. But then there's the imperative to, now that you know about it, you got to do something about it. Yeah, and so it doesn't let you off the hook in that sense at yeah. all, right? I mean, it, it, it's a book about how do you take responsibility yeah. for the bias. Yeah. Before we go there, um, one of the most fascinating aspects of the research, your research, uh, for me was, um, to read the data that show that black people themselves have these biases against black people. Yeah. Um, to know that black police, to know, to read that you were pulled over and mistreated, physically assaulted yeah. by police in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a day or two before getting your PhD. From, yeah, one day before. One day before getting graduation. your PhD from Harvard. Um, she's driving and um, has a violent encounter with uh, police officers in Cambridge and the main officer was black. Yeah. And um, so to read that we do this to us yeah. was sort of devastating. Um, and yet it helped me feel slightly better about the biases I know I've had growing up. You know, knowing that as a child, I learned like Everett, that yeah. beautiful story you told about your five-year-old son, your middle son, Everett, yeah. Yeah. on the plane, seeing a black man, saying he looks like daddy, and then jumping to the conclusion, I hope he doesn't rob us. Five-year-old Everett had learned that from yeah. America. Yep. I learned that too. 
I became this person trying to perform the part of the articulate, highly educated black person, you know, to counteract a stereotype. You know, I was told that I was the stereotype and I worked for decades to try to be black but smart, you know? And then I finally worked that shit out and, <laughs> you know, uh, now I really don't care what y'all think, and, um, which is awesome. And um, we're all on this journey, but, um, but let's, let's go there to what, um, to what this does to our black children. So many people in the audience um, are parents. I think we have black parents in the audience. Um, the, for those of us raising black children, educating black children, mentoring, coaching, loving black children, what can we do to teach them about this stuff mm -hmm. so that their rational selves somehow can overtake what they're learning by way of implicit bias against them? I mean, this is a very, yeah. it's a tightrope we walk to teach them about these things and yet simultaneously teach them that they're worthy of love right. and respect and, and so on. So right. what have you done or what do you advise others to do at the level of the individual child in your home or in your classroom? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I can tell you first a, a shorter story uh, about a, a, another son, my oldest son, um, and Maybe. dealing with this, because this was, you know, the first time as a parent that I was confronting uh, all of this was with him, and he was very, um, even, you know, as a young boy, very interested and curious about race, and. He um, asked me one time, this was uh, you know, around Thanksgiving and I'm sort of making dinner in the kitchen and he uh, said, you know, mommy, he says, do you think that uh, people kind of see black people a little different from other people? And I said, well, what do you mean a little different? What are you talking about? And he says, well, I just think that there's something different. He says, I think there's something extra special there. He's a, he's a first grader, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, okay, well, I said, well, well, tell me, you know, what do you mean? Sort of give me some examples. And so he thought about it, and then he says, oh, well, remember we were in the Safeway the other day, and um, we were in the Safeway in an area that was mostly all white. Um, he says a black man walked into the grocery store, and, and I saw um, that people kind of stayed away from him a little bit. And it was like he had a giant force field around him. He was really into Star Wars back then. So. <laughs> and then he said, and when he got in the line, his line was the shortest line for a long time. And it was just interesting because I noticed the guy come in the store, but I didn't, I didn't analyze it. I mean, I hadn't even thought about it until he brought it back to me, back to my attention. And I said, well, what do you think it means? And he says, I don't know. And he started thinking about it and thinking about it. And then he looked up at me and he says, I think it's fear. Mm. And I tell you, I mean, that was like, I think my first encounter as a parent, like dealing with yeah. how my son was grappling with race. And I, had, I, was, I was just putting the turkey into the oven and I burned my hand. I bet you did. I did, and yeah. that burn stayed on my hand for like a year. Every time I looked at my hand, I would think about that conversation with my son. And um, I, he, you know, it's, it's one of those things that's kind of interesting too, because whenever you talk about these things, people feel like, oh, it's the media, you know, it's this or that, or it's, you know, all these, this is how we get those messages. And I feel like, I mean, at that time, my child watched no television, right? Mm -hmm. But um, it, it, was, it was a way in which, I mean, yeah, all these things matter, but it's also us. You know, I think, you know, our children watch us and they watch what we do and they're trying to figure out, you know, from our own movements, you know, um, how certain people are regarded, who to stay away from, you know, who's okay, who's not okay, right? And so, you know, they're picking up um, all of this from how we just move through the world. And so, um, for me, I don't know, it, it just, um, it, um, you know, as, as children, you know, the, the, you know, the job of a child is to figure out what goes with what, what correlates with what. And so they're looking at us all t the time for sort of um, to, to, to um, point the way and to indicate uh, to them who's safe and who's not safe and so forth. 
So a lot of this, you know, we can't just put on the media or put on sort of our institutions, but we, we uh, embody this and, and our children pick that up and, 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 um, and, and how we do so. So um, the, the other uh, piece of the question is sort of what to do about that, right? Yeah. And, and I was trying to do the same thing with him that I did with Everett on the airplane, which is um, helping him to interrogate his own mind, yeah. right? Helping him to slow down, you know, helping him to reflect on, well, how did, why am I acting this way? Where did I get that idea? Why do I have this association, right? And so then they're able to do that, um, you know, without our prodding, right? They're able to do that for themselves when we're not present. They can slow down and sort of think about what they're thinking about and what that means and, and, and trying to uh, wrestle uh, back control over that. So if they're watching our every movement mm -hmm. and picking up cues from us, learning about the world because of how we behave and how we speak and to whom and about what, um, what's your advice to the audience about a common way in which we may be biased in the grocery store, for right. example? Your child saw the black man appear to have a force field because everybody was steering a wide berth around him yes. and wasn't standing in line, that he had the shortest line. What's your advice? How do we take this and go out to the Trader Joe's and the Safeway and the wherever, Whole Foods, fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so right? Uh, the market, wherever it is. You know, I mean, I mean my, this, my, yeah. the advice is the same as, you know, for a child as it would be for the adult. I yeah. mean, it's, it's, it's about adding friction to our lives. It's about um, slowing down. It's, it's about um, sort of thinking about, um, you know, so not going on automatic uh, pilot and sort of doing things without thinking. Um, because um, when we do that, we, we give up a lot of um, our agency, we give up our control. You know, I feel like with um, social media now, especially, right, um, we're, we're, we, we give a lot away. Um, yeah. We don't have to think as much, we don't have to remember num telephone numbers, we don't have to remember other things. We have people that we kind of go to and trust to, you know, think things through for us and to try to, um, you know, to, to um, actually um, get control of, over that again, right? So that we can um, be uh, more conscious of, of what we're doing. And in charge of our actions. Exactly. So you're saying slow it down. You're right. in the Safeway. You're in the shopping center of choice. Slow it down. Think as you're walking. Become more aware yeah. of who you're avoiding and ask yourself, what's going on? Right. Why am I doing that? Right. Become aware of who you're smiling at and not. Become aware of the line. I'm making this up. Right. Is this any of it this? Is, it makes sense. Yeah, that's good. That's I like advice. it. I like it. And be aware of the effect of that. Yeah. Be aware of the effect of, of you know, the message that you're sending. Um, be aware of who's harmed by that. Um, you know, so. Yeah, so I'm having this. I'm, I'm um, um, fast forwarding to next week when there's going to be an article in the local newspaper about like, Black people are consistently getting smiled at in the grocery <laughs> store. Like, what is up with that, people? Um, but you know, I mean, would that be a bad thing? I don't know. If all of a sudden all the white people decided they were going to try really hard to be extra nice, um, I think that might be amazing. So, um, okay, but that's not an official recommendation of this program. Okay, um, you, you're, you're asking good questions, so let me, um, let me see how we're doing, and I want to I try to turn to some of them. Okay, what do I say to my friend? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Um, it says that, but I, the emphasis was mine. What do I say to my friend who says, racial bias in regards to crime is correct because crime rates are higher for blacks. She says blacks are more likely to commit crimes and should be racially profiled. Wow, okay. Um, so we can start with... Um some facts. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so there are racial disparities in the crime rate and in, in a lot of uh, diverse cities and major cities. I mean, there are racial disparities in Oakland, for example, where I do a lot of work with the police department there. You know, there are racial disparities in New York, you know, where I talked about the NYPD. 
And um, I, I think you know, one of the messages I wanted to give in the presentation was about how those um, disparities um, can be seen in really different ways. And so some people think about um, you know, these disparities, um, both in terms of the crime rate, but also in terms of the you know, sort of incarceration rate and so forth, um, that, um, you know, that, that that means something's going on, like that something's wrong, there, that there's something to intervene on, um, that there's a, a reason um, for this that we need to uh, take action on and, and, to, and to correct. But for some people, and I, I think this is especially true in a country like ours where everything is about um, individual will and choice and all of that, that you see a disparity and you think, oh, that disparity is there because these people are just like that. You know, they're inherently like that or whatever it is. And, and th you don't see um, the, um, you know, the uh, structural element of it. You don't see, um, you know, the systemic issues that exist around it. Um, you just see the behavior or you just see wh what you see in front of you and you make the assessment that, um, you know, that, that this is about uh, those people. Um, and so once the disparity is already there, and, and the disparities can be there for a whole lot of reasons, which I tried to highlight a little bit in the presentation, the disparity itself can um, lead to bias. I mean, I think a lot of people, think about you know, bias as something that can lead to you know, different disparities that we see in the world, but the disparities themselves can lead people um, to develop um, bias and to sort of think that, um, you know, that these disparities are there and that they're there for a reason and that they're permanent and that there's nothing that we're doing to um, actually keep that um, sort of disparity alive and where it is. Um, so I think that that's a, so interrogating that I think um, would, be, um, would be a good, a good first step. Um, uh, pro racial profiling is actually, um, you know, police departments, I mean, this is not something they're supposed to be doing. This is something that they uh, say they don't do or they, or they try not to do, uh, right? And, and this is something, profiling is something, say, uh, for example, an officer could, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an offense that, um, where you could get fired, you know, uh, for that, but, but, but it still happens. Um, and it still happens because they are seeing um, disparities um, out there that they're, you know, sort of interpreting in a certain way um, and, and, and sort of thinking about the, the people um, who are engaged in criminal activity um, in, this, in this categorical way, um, in, in, in a racial way. And so that can lead them to, um, you know, stop, you know, uh, people who are of that category, who fit the description, right, um, um, who aren't actually engaged in criminal activity. And so that leads to the, you know, so that's another harm that we can talk about. A lot of the data that I presented on the NYPD, um, you know, th these were people, you know, who were, uh, being, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people who were um, being stopped on the streets of New York City. They were, they were young kids. I mean, they, they were um, young adults. They, they were, um, you know, people high school age or college age. And um, I think something like, um, I think 90, uh, if you add black and brown, black and Latino, um, um, you know, uh, citizens, um, you know, it was like 90% of, of those stops were of those, um, those kids. Okay. And then you talk about the safety too, like there's safety on all, you know, so there's sort of people felt like that's what needed to happen to, um, you know, for the city to stay safe. But yeah. since, since that, um, you know, so this was all uh, deemed, the, the, the stop and frisk practices, the aggressive stop and frisk pra practices were deemed unconstitutional. And so, um, uh, so, so that changed in New York. There was a lot of worry by New Yorkers that changing this, the crime rate was gonna go way up and it was gonna be a big problem. But it, as it turns out, the crime rate continued to fall and it turned out that they actually didn't need to stop you know, hundreds of thousands of black and brown, um, you know, young people mm -hmm. um, to, um, you know, keep the crime rate low. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the, when you're a member of a, of a marginalized group about which negative stereotypes are held, you, all members of the group are sort of presumed to be uh, uh, exhibiting the behaviors of one. So uh, when you're not, however, um, 
uh, you get to act, when you're not a member of that kind of group, um, when someone in your group acts uh, out, your entire group isn't judged. Yeah. So for example, the presumption that black people are far more prone to criminality um, leads people to say all, all of them do that. Right. When we have mass shootings on college campuses, they are almost always the work of males and, and male identified people and almost always white. No one's saying white people are mass shooters. Well, black people are saying that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> in our communities of color, we're like, can you believe another one of those white people went and shot up a school? <laughs> but, um, but in the main, our media doesn't say, right, terrorist, mm -hmm. right? They say lone wolf, yeah. right? They attribute it to him and his problems, yep. not his group. Right. Um, and I yeah. think that's kind of what, what this question is, is getting at. Okay, um, in your book, you discuss how our brains are primed to know one's own races physical features much better than other races. It's called the same race effect? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, in a practical That's way, great. how do we as teachers and educators help our children and students strengthen other neural connections to promote social inclusivity, to go beyond the physical of what we perceive to be like-minded? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, so, so the uh, questioner is asking about this uh, same race effect, which is just the idea that we are um, better able to recognize faces from our own uh, r uh, race, a racial group, than we are to recognize the individual faces of other groups. Um, but a, a lot of that um, is driven, and so we found um, some, uh, you know, sort of a, a neural correlates for this effect, and so there's an area of the brain called the fusiform face area that's implicated in face processing, and we see in that area of the brain that uh, it's responding um, less uh, to faces of, uh, of other races than the faces of, um, of your own race when you're in a neural imaging scanner. But a lot of that um, is driven by um, you know how we live exposure. and who we yes exposure yeah. and who we're in coming fact, into contact with. You couldn't tell white people apart. I could when not you were a young I, child, I she writes about this in the book. I do. Yeah. She grew up in an all-black community, right, and then moved to a different community. Yeah. When I was 12 years old. Better schools, quote unquote, mostly white. Discovered yeah. she couldn't discern the white faces. Yeah. It was really hard to make friends because of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, are you my friend? You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was difficult, but my brain was able to adjust over time. I, I was able to figure out what features, uh, you, you know, to look at and all of that. And so, um, so anyway, so, so, so it's an example, I think, of how um, divided we are as a society and how we live and, 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 and everything. And, um, and it, you know, it's, and, and that has a history, too, and which yeah. um, relates to the, the previous question. It's just not the, the case that you know, just, you know, say African Americans, for example, just decided to live sort of separately, you know, from everyone else. There were all these policies, you know, across time um, that, um, you know, that produced that. Like our federal government was uh, very much involved in, um, you know, producing segregated neighborhoods, and that was the desired effect. And a lot of people think about, you know, policies as having an effect on um, your, um, you know, life outcomes and so forth, and, and which is true and is, is uh, bad enough, but uh, those policies can also affect who we are as people. I mean, it, it affects our, um, you know, our brain wiring. Um, so, so it's, you know, so the, so the social world out there actually gets, um, you know, inside, yeah. right? And it starts to affect um, yeah. how our brains function. Yeah. And, and, and so that's a real thing. Um, so, the, so the answer to that yeah. is, is, is more integration. If you want to really see people, not just their faces, but to really right. see people, um, understand people, it's, it's about connection. Yeah, so where we live, who, with whom we socialize, where we send our kids to school, these are all choices. Sometimes they don't feel like choices, or they feel like we've made the right choice because of these variables. But if we care about these issues, yeah. then living in a converse, community that's more diverse than less turns out to be a really important yeah. factor, yeah. right? Yeah. More exposure to one another decreases our likelihood of having these biases against one another, and in particular against black and yeah. brown people. All right. Um, my elementary age son who is black seems to experience bias, mostly generated from other parents. 
rather than teachers. How should I handle parents excluding my son from birthday parties, grade level outings, sport events, etc.? How should I handle parents excluding my son? Hmm. Okay, let me answer this. I okay. Have a thought, I have a this. <laughs> yeah. Well, Julie wrote the I'm book on sure, parenting. No, so. I'm not sure. It's not the parenting book that I'm thinking of. It's my own journey as a black child. Oh. But I'm not sure if y'all have conduct, conducted studies on this one. But here's what I'm going to say. Okay. If you notice this happening to a child in your child's grade or class, you be the parent that makes sure you're reaching out and offering a play date and inviting them to birthday parties. Somebody took their kid out of a swimming pool because I was in it when I was seven, okay? That hurts, all right? What all of us can do is try to be sure that when we see exclusion happening, forget trying to change the mind of the biased or racist parent, be the person to counteract it. Send the invitation, make the play date happen. You be the one to include that kid and to hell with those people. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> now, let's see what our eminent scholar has to say. Are we done? We're done. Okay, we're done. I, I, okay, we're yeah, not I done. Think we're we not are. done. Okay, what would you, you say? You handled that quite well. What I, would you say? Go. I like what you said. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, it looks like, gosh, time flies when you're having fun, and this has been amazing. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, so I'm going to wrap these, the sort of like, what's the call to action? How can everybody in this room uh, counteract our own implicit bias? What can we be doing? I know you say in the book, let's not make the mistake of thinking the work is done. Yeah. We're not post-racial. Everyone, I hope, in this room knows <laughs> that, right? How do we teach the next generation? What's the call to action? Um, what active disciplines can be practiced? Like, what would you have us go out of here and do? You know, I would have us, I don't know if this is on still. Uh, oh, maybe it's not. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Okay, wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess I can't find. I would have us look at those, um, you know, the situational uh, triggers and sort of think about how to marshal uh, what you know about um, the social environments that are more likely um, to um, lead to bias um, and to um, try to figure out ways that, that you can counteract that and, 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 and not just for your, in, your own individual life, right, but also um, everybody who's in that environment will be affected by that, right? Is it and easy? So you, uh, some, sometimes it's easier than we think. Um, sometimes we feel like... Um, you know, the whole, you know, we have to wait 100 years and all of that to do, but, but there are things that we can do on a daily basis. There are things that we can do now. Um, and a lot of those, the situational triggers that were up there is, is just about keeping those in mind. And, and so if you know a trigger, again, is, is um, when you're not thinking and you're on automatic pilot, uh, pilot slow it down. Um, just slowing it down, just adding a moment of reflection it, 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 and, and practicing you know, that yeah. um, I, I think is, is uh, super important. But I don't want, I mean, I, I feel like so we can do those things and those things are easier I do feel like the heavier lift yes. has to do with the racial narratives that exist um, that um, help us to interpret for example the disparities that are out there so the racial narrative that you know black people are just inherently criminal without actually looking um, you know further uh, so or, or, or they look for you know evidence uh, for that um, in terms of racial disparities in the criminal justice system them and so forth. So, so unpacking those narratives, like sort of, um, you know, uh, trying to um, intervene on that, I think is incredibly important for us as a society. Um, and people have roles that they can play in that. I mean, there are a lot of people now in the entertainment industry who are trying to um, um, challenge those narratives. They're, they're making movies and they're doing all kinds of creative work um, around helping people to reflect more on their lives and the lives of others and to you know, have um, a greater understanding, greater empathy, and, and just shifting um, you know, you know, their normal um, sort of stories that they tell themselves about why the world is the way it is. So. 
I've been working on this myself. As a 52-year-old black woman who is also biracial, I came to terms in my 40s with the fact that I had been biased against me and people like me, that racism had infected my brain. And I've got biases toward all kinds of people, I realize. I've got, you know, I have stereotypes that come up in my head around social class, socioeconomic class, around the way people look. And I have a practice now that I'm gonna offer as a very practical thing for those of you who are interested in, in uh, a practice you could uh, take on for yourself. Mine is this. When I am interacting with an individual and I notice myself stereotyping, and a mindfulness practice over time will allow you to notice your own stereotypes, the minute you notice it, you begin to dissipate its strength. Now, I'm not a psychologist. You, you mm -hmm. Tell me if this is remotely the way the brain works, <laughs> but I have found it to be the truth that when I notice a, a stereotype coming up in my head, if I, can, if I can actually notice it and say, oh, Julie, you're about to stereotype this person, just that little conversation with myself, mm -hmm. and then say to myself, how about you just treat this person the way you want to be treated, okay? Or pretend like this person's your best friend. Like I have these little tricks to tell myself that resets my brain and then it allows me to just interact with the human like they're a human. Yeah. Imagine that. It allows me to look at them with eye contact and make a smile and take an interest in them. And whatever the stereotype was that had come up for me, you know, is no longer kind of running my brain. Now it might be back tomorrow. Maybe if I work on it enough, it won't be back tomorrow. Maybe it won't be back next month. I offer that to you as an example of what you can do within your own mind yeah. to take hold of some of this stuff. Yeah. Does yeah. that sound good? It does sound good. It is. I, I like it. <laughs> I think the power are, of reflection. The power of reflection. Yeah. This is sometimes easy, but it also requires bravery and guts. This problem of implicit bias infects our society, our community, and our own selves. But I think you are here tonight because you know that and you want to be a part of changing that. Please join me in giving Dr. Eberhard a huge round of applause. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Great. You're great. Thank you.